Mark 1 and verse 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. What was John doing? He was dunking people in the waters of the Jordan River. And what was it for? Was it because they enjoyed the cool, clear waters in springtime? <laughs> and probably not. If people enjoyed the water, they were certainly capable of doing it on their own uh, without John's help. John was, as it says here in Mark, administering a baptism, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And why, what was this for? Was it because the water had spiritual benefits? Just no scrubbing necessary, just a dunking will do. Uh, instantly removes all sins. Uh, no, the water was symbolic. The whole baptism was symbolic. Uh, it was a symbol of something else. The water and the actions were done in the physical world to picture a spiritual reality. We might say it was a drama in which people were acting out part of the story. Now, the water didn't have any magical properties. Um, John was not a magician who could use water to manipulate the spiritual world. Now, we can get a hint of this simply by looking at the location. There were lots of baptismal pools in Jerusalem, uh, but John was doing his work by the Jordan River. The water wasn't better there than anywhere else, but it was a, a symbolic location. It was a reminder of when the Israelites first entered the land of Canaan in the days of Joshua. John the Baptist was taking people to the edge of the land and telling them they needed to start over in life. Now, John didn't invent the idea of baptism. He, Jews had long been using it for a couple of purposes. For one, they used it for temple purposes. So before people went into the temple, they dunked themselves in water. And that's why there were lots of baptismal pools in Jerusalem. Even in other cities, uh, they had them because they did a ritual cleansing before they did various rituals in Judaism. In Acts 21, we see the Apostle Paul participated in one of these rituals, uh, cleansing rituals, before a ceremony at the temple. The people in the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls community at Qumran, uh, they did it every day, uh, just to be sure. Uh, for these ritual baptisms, people dunked themselves. And the second person, the uh, second reason that the uh, people, the Jewish people, used baptism was for proselytes, for Gentiles who wanted to become Jewish, follow the customs of the Jewish community. They were symbolically dunked in water to symbolize cleansing and to symbolize the end of their old identity and beginning a new identity as part of the Jewish community. Most scholars think that John's baptism was something like this uh, because people weren't baptizing themselves, but John was baptizing them. He was taking them at, to the edge of the promised land having them come back in as new people. It symbolized a major change in their life. Uh, it was a baptism of repentance, uh, as John said, for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, something had been wrong with their old uh, way of life, their old approach, and, and in response to the preaching of Jesus, or John, they, had to, they decided to make a change in the way they were thinking. And that would, of course, result in a way that they were a change in the way they were living. They were acting out this drama, symbolizing this change in their life. And if we read forward into the story, we'll see that Jesus participated in this drama, too. Uh, he was baptized. 
some of the disciples of John soon became disciples of Jesus because John pointed them to Jesus. John had come to prepare the way for Jesus. Once he came, John then pointed them to follow Jesus. And when Jesus came to be baptized, John said, well, you don't need to be baptized. You don't have any sins to repent of. You don't need to make any major changes in your life. Uh, but Jesus wanted to participate in the ceremony anyway, partly as an example for us. Jesus' disciples continued to baptize people. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, uh, verses 19 and 20, we see what's called the Great Commission. Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So he, Jesus himself commanded baptism, and the disciples did it. They continued to use baptism as a miniature drama that symbolized for the people the beginning of new life as believers in Jesus, as Lord and Savior. The book of Acts, Acts describes it. The Apostle Paul tells us more about it, what it means for us today. That baptism is still a dramatic action. It's a drama that pictures two things at once, cleansing and renewal. It's the burial of an old way of life, the cleansing of all remnants of that old way, and starting off in a clean and new direction. And I should point out that nobody does this perfectly. <laughs> the Apostle Peter, for example, he was probably baptized near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But when we read the gospel stories of what Peter did and how much he understood uh, we can see that he, he had only a fraction, and he had some major problems too. Uh, but there's no hint that any of the disciples got rebaptized after Jesus rose from the dead and the Holy Spirit was poured out. Uh, baptism doesn't mark either a perfect uh, rock-solid faith or a perfect rock-solid commitment, uh, but Jesus still commanded his disciples to baptize people. A baptism pictures a change that should happen, uh, but there's no expectation that we'll do it perfectly. Paul brings out some of the symbolism uh, of baptism in Romans chapter 6. Uh, and here he's not saying, okay, now I'm going to explain what baptism is, uh, how it's done, the words we're supposed to use. Uh, no, he just takes baptism as something that the people were already familiar with, something that had already happened to, uh, you know, to them, with them. And he is using baptism to answer a different question. In this case, the question is, does God's grace mean it's okay for us to sin? And, well, the answer is no. No, it's not okay to sin. Sin is contrary to everything that Christ stood for. He wants us to escape the slavery of sin. He doesn't want us to continue living in sin. But what does Paul say about baptism? Well, we'll see it in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Baptism means we died with Christ. We were buried with Christ. The old self died and now we live and walk in a new way, just like Jesus was raised from the dead. The old way's gone, we live in a new way. Uh, in, in the context and purpose of this passage, Paul is saying that the old and sinful way of living is, is supposed to be dead. A new and right way of living is supposed to be alive in Christ. And he says that baptism corresponds to this change in the way we live. Baptism pictures our death and burial with Jesus, being put in the water. It's like being put into a, this liquid grave. Coming up out of the water pictures rising to from death to new life, a new way of life. Now, this is something that Jesus did in the past. 
Baptism is a reminder of something that was done in the past. If we were buried with Christ, that happened a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> it's not happening now. What we're doing now in baptism is picturing and remembering what happened with Jesus in the past. In some ways, that's like the annual the Jewish celebration of Passover. They are commemorating this exodus from Egypt, commemorating their escape from slavery uh, with some ritual symbolism, a lamb, some unleavened bread, some herbs. Uh, these things were a drama uh, to help remind them of the salvation that God had given them in the past. And in a similar way, baptism reminds us of what Jesus did to save us. He died for our sins, to bring all of our sins to the grave. And he rose to bring us to new life, a life in which those sins are not counted against us, a life in which we're not supposed to continue in sin. Baptism reminds us of a story, the story of Jesus, in which there's this movement from old to new. And baptism pictures our participation in that story from old to new. In some ways, the entire Christian life can be compared to a drama, uh, especially a improvised drama. In an improv drama, we don't just do anything we want, like play checkers while everybody else is playing the tuba or playing cowboys and ranchers. Uh, and, now, in an improv drama, there are characters who have certain personalities and if we want to participate in the drama, then we learn what the character is like. And we try to respond in a way that's appropriate to that character's personality. And that's something we do in the Christian life. We try to understand what Jesus is like. We try to live in our world in a way that accurately reflects the values and beliefs of Jesus. Now, there are some... Um, important differences in, in this, uh, mainly that we're not just imitating this Jesus on our own, but the Holy Spirit is in us, transforming us by the renewing of our minds so that we are progressively becoming more like Jesus. And he lives in us, Paul says. But still, the overall picture of an improv drama can be used to describe the Christian life. We are invited to participate in that drama. Another important difference is that we find out that the drama is actually the real world. <laughs> we are invited to stop living by the script of the world around us and to adopt and adapt the script of Jesus. The world around us says, do your own thing. You are the captain of your own self. You are in charge. You need to be authentic to yourself. You have the right of self-determination, self-authenticity, self-actualization, or other words. But that is really an, an illusion. It's the wrong script. If we play that way, the drama turns out to be a tragedy, ending in death. The basic creed of Christianity is that we're not in charge of our own life. We're not in control. We don't have the power to determine our fate. We don't have the power to turn the tragedy around. The end thereof is the way of death, the Bible says. But what's reality? The reality is, is, is that Jesus is Lord. He's our creator. He's got the right <laughs> to write the script. He's our Savior. He paid the price to be able to direct the play. He invites us into his drama, not so that we can pretend to be good people, but so that we can be transformed by Christ working in and through us, bringing us from the ways of death into the ways that give life, that prepare us for life eternal, that make it possible for eternal life to be full of joy and peace rather than envy and striving. Instead of a tragedy, Jesus says that our drama
can be a comedy uh, in which we all have the last laugh. There's a fantastically good ending instead of a dismal, fatalistic one. So there's two, two dramas going on around us, all the same, all, all of the, uh, around us all the time, sometimes even inside of us. In one drama, we take life into our own hands, try to act like we can decide for ourselves what's right and what's, what's wrong, what's good, what's not, uh, what's good for us. And the end of that drama is death. Because when we live just under our own power, we die. Because no matter how hard we try, we don't have the power to change the end of that story. And actually, we find out there, there are some unseen actors in this story. There are spiritual forces that try to deceive us into thinking that this is the best we can do. The story in Genesis 3 pictures this. That this serpent, serpent deceived Eve into thinking and taking this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, deciding for herself what was good and evil. Serpent, the serpent said, you can be the master of your own fate. You can be like God, be in charge of your own life. Make your own decisions. She fell for it. So did Adam. The Apostle Paul tells us that we wrestle against wicked spirits. And this would include any spirits that try to deceive us into thinking that we can write our own script and manage our own life. But the track record is pretty consistent. Everybody ends up dying. If we ever hope for a different ending, we need to look for a new script. And Jesus offers us one. In his own resurrection, he shows that it has a much happier ending. Or rather, it doesn't have an ending at all. It just keeps going on and on, better and better. And this script says that Jesus is Lord. He's the creator. He's got the right. He knows a lot more about life than we do. Uh, he says the way of life is love. Uh, and he proved it in his own life. He proved that it works through the resurrection of the dead. It worked for him. And he promises that he will work it for us as well. He invites us into his drama, encourages us to learn a new role, to be transformed into that role in preparation for holding that role forever and ever. So we're either participating in one drama or another. We can't change that. We have to make decisions every day. Either we make them according to our own standard or we look to Jesus to provide a different standard. Uh, either we follow our own script or we try to get in harmony with the Jesus script. Now, he's the one who invented the play. He provides the stage on which life is played. He provides a script that he says will work the best. And either we accept what he offers or we can, uh, even though we have far less experience in life. And we can decide to make it up on our own, even though everybody else who's tried that has not ended up well. Choose life, he says. Even though the devil will try to des describe his way as a way of life, it's not. And we can see the results. He really doesn't have much to offer. Uh, but Jesus offers something dramatically different. A dramatically different drama. A different script for organizing life, making decisions, and developing relationships. The devil offers temporary pleasures, but Jesus offers eternal life. In some ways, it sounds like a simple decision, but it's often a difficult decision to make, to determine which drama to invest our energies in. 400 some years ago, Blaise Pascal was a mathematician. He compared Christianity to a wager. He says, if there's no God, there's no purpose. You really have nothing to lose. But if there is a God, you have everything to gain. <coughs> the only smart wager is to go for the <laughs> go for the game. Baptism is one small scene in the drama of life. 
It just announces which drama we want to be part of. It says, we don't want to be part of the devil's drama. I, I, I don't want to pretend to be the master of my own life as if I can make up the rules or create whatever ending I want. Uh, baptism says, my hope isn't in myself, but in Jesus. I want to follow his script, to be in his drama, to participate in the happy ending that he promises. Now, we might think, well, I'm not ready for that commitment. I'd rather keep my options open a little longer. I'll decide for myself <coughs> when and how I do this. But it, when, I, when we do that, we're still participating in the devil's drama. We're trying to pretend that we are in charge of our own life. We're still acting out the script that says we can do it ourselves. In some ways, we are never ready for this kind of commitment. None of us have the power to actually follow through on what we would like to do. Uh, we all have a checkered history, partly in the right drama, and partly in the wrong. But baptism is a miniature drama that says, I'd like to be in the Jesus drama as best I can. As one man said to Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. He knew that he wasn't a super example of faith and commitment, but in some ways he was more honest than Peter was. Peter acted all confident and failed several times. He thought he could live the Jesus script on his own, but he hadn't understood what the Jesus script really is. The man who said, help my unbelief, was more honest in his inability. But Jesus honored the small amount of faith that he had, and that's often what baptism is for us. It's a declaration of the, the direction we'd like to go. Not a guarantee we're gonna be good at it. We know that we need help. It's actually part of the Jesus drama, that we need help. So what is baptism? It's a declaration of our commitment to Jesus. Yeah, but in a more important sense, it is a drama that pictures the commitment that Jesus has to us. Our, that we show that we are committed, yeah, that's right. But it's, that's not the main purpose. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they had an annual celebration of their exodus. They weren't commemorating their faith. Oh, we were good enough to walk through the waters. Uh, they were commemorating what God had done for them. And in the same way, in baptism, we commemorate what Jesus has done for us. He gets the credit. He has transitioned us from death to life. So we don't baptize ourselves. It's done to us, uh, reflecting the fact that salvation is given to us. It's not based on wonder, what, how wonderful we are, what good things we've done. Uh, we might not do it unless we have faith in Jesus, but it, it's not commemorating our faith. Um, our faith is weak. It's fallible. Uh, but it commemorates what Jesus has done. It's a ceremony in which we acknowledge he died for us. We died with him. We were buried with him. We rose to new life in him. That is the drama, the script that we want to participate in. The most important transition in life was accomplished by Jesus 2,000 years ago. He did it. Our part is to acknowledge it. And that's why baptism is a ceremony that's done only once. Uh, if it pictured our current life in Christ, uh, then it would be okay to keep doing it as often as we wanted to. That's the communion that pictures our continuing life in Christ. But baptism is only done, done once for each person, and it's picturing this dramatic transition in life that was done once. And so it doesn't have to be repeated. Jesus has taken us from being sinners to being saints, from being condemned to being sanctified. Uh, he has done it. Our part is just catching on to it. Uh, we need to repeat it. We don't need to repeat it every time we come back to faith. 
or to come to some new level of understanding because it pictures what he did once for all time. The decisive thing has been done by Jesus. Our baptism isn't valid unless the suffering and death of Jesus is valid. <laughs> Our faith cannot make it so. It is so, regardless of whether we believe in it. But when we believe it, when we acknowledge it, we participate in this ceremony of baptism. This baptism in water commemorates, signifies Jesus' baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection on our behalf. In Colossians 1, uh, Paul describes what was done for us. Colossians 1, verse, uh, verses 12 and 13. We give joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. He's brought us from this domain of sin and death, this drama of sin and death, uh, into the domain of righteousness and life, the drama of life. That transition, transition is pictured by this ceremony of baptism. When you were baptized, you were acknowledging that Jesus is your Savior. You are cleansed by what he did. And that's done. You can always look back and say, I have been baptized. I belong to Christ. His death and resurrection saved me. I'm already in his kingdom. That cannot be taken away. I don't need to go through the ceremony again because it never stopped being true. I have been baptized. I acknowledge what he did for me. Colossians 2 adds a little more. Verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, that pictures us being included in this more important transition buried with Jesus, being raised to life in him. Verse 13 tells us it includes the forgiveness of our sins. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Just as the Israelites went from slavery in Egypt to freedom by going through the Red Sea, just like the Corinthian people went from being sinners to being sanctified for God in Christ. Set apart. Designated. Not perfect. So also we make a transition. Or maybe I could say the transition was made for us. We've been brought from darkness to light. From the kingdom of death into the kingdom of Christ, from the drama of sin and the devil, into the drama of Christ. Because, even though we didn't know it at the time, we died with Christ and rose with him. And that's pictured by the ceremony of baptism. And there are some here who haven't been baptized. I'd like to encourage you to be baptized doesn't matter if you're not good enough for it. None of us are. It doesn't matter if you're not absolutely positive about the validity of it. That's okay. The ceremony isn't about the quality of your faith. It's about the quality of our Savior. It's just acknowledging that Jesus died for our sins, that we were included in his suffering and death, and in his resurrection too. It's acknowledging that he's forgiven our sins, cleansed our guilt, brought us into the kingdom of Christ. Each of you belong to him, whether you believe it or not. And in baptism we say, okay, I admit it. It's about him, not about me. I want to be part of the drama instead of acting like I can do it on my own. If anybody here would like to be baptized, come talk to us. I'd like to help. Let's pray.
Father, we do thank you for what Jesus has done for us. And we thank, we're thankful for the invitation to be part of it. And that is why he came. That is why he did what he did, to die for that we might live again. Help us join him in what he's doing in our life, to respond to it, to joyfully accept the better ending, the better story, the better drama. We thank you for opening our eyes to understand what you have offered. And we know we still need more to grow in our understanding. So we ask your continued guidance and help in that. We give you thanks and pray it in Jesus' name.